it's, um, you know, it's a blessing. And um, the Bible actually says, in the book of James, it says, Pure religion and undefiled before the Father is this, to visit the widows and the orphans in their afflictions and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. So two of the most vulnerable persons in the world are widows and children. And uh, God is extremely interested in helping widows and children. And uh, it's something that I hope in our own church that we're able to develop more of a ministry in that area. We do already have quite a bit, I mean, actually a lot in that area, but uh, there's always such a, such a need. But we're in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and if you'll please stand with me for just a few moments, and I would like to welcome any of you who may be visiting this evening. Uh, glad that you're here. We hope you feel at home. We're going through the Bible. If you need a Bible, just uh, let one of the ushers know. And um, we also want to welcome our internet uh, viewers, those of you who may be watching via the internet. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, just a few verses, and then we'll pray. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the Spirit he speaks mysteries, but he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. Father, we thank you for edification. We thank you for the strength that you give to us. I'm sure that so often, Lord, we're oblivious to the fact that you are strengthening us, but then there are so many times when we're, it's so obvious to us that we are without strength. We're just run down, run out. We don't have the capacity to deal with whatever the circumstance may be. And yet, Lord, through your word, you're faithful to, to edify us, to put strength in our inner man. And we ask, Lord, that by your Holy Spirit this evening, that that's exactly what you would do. You would strengthen the inner man. We love you, Father. We pray that you would minister now in all of the ways that this congregation here tonight needs. And we ask, Lord, that we might have the personal resolve to be responsive to you and to obey you and to follow you. Thank you for the glowing testimony, the work of so many people to provide these beautiful gifts to children that perhaps will only meet in heaven, no doubt, will only meet them in heaven. And in each of those little boxes is a gospel tract, a presentation of Jesus Christ. And we pray for each of the boxes that are on this property and that will be on this property throughout the week that the Holy Spirit of God would use those little gospel presentations in whatever language and whatever area of the world they go to, to reveal Jesus Christ to that little child and perhaps to their siblings and to their parents and their friends, and that they might come to know Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Well, Paul is really wrapping up in the 14th chapter uh, his teaching on spiritual gifts, which he started with back in chapter 12. If you'll notice there in chapter 12 in verse 1, he says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, 
I do not want you to be ignorant. And of course, spiritual gifts are divine uh, gifts. They, they come from God. They're not uh, toys to be played with, but they're really tools that God uses in our lives to work with and to build up the kingdom of God and to build up the body and to proclaim the word of God. And the Corinthian church um, was very confused about what these gifts were, how these gifts were to be used. And so throughout the 12th chapter and the 13th chapter and now in the 14th chapter, he's addressing the subject of spiritual gifts. And he begins in verse 1 of chapter 14 by saying this. He says, pursue love. If you stop there for a moment and go back to chapter 13, the very last verse, verse 13, it says, and now abide faith, hope, and faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love, take away the chapter heading, pursue love. So it's really, this chapter flows right out of chapter 13. So he's telling us to pursue love or let love be your highest goal. Let that be the thing that you're really uh, pursuing the most. Put that at the top of your list as compared to anything else. But then he goes on to say in verse 1, and desire spiritual gifts but especially that you may prophesy. So he's setting the tone right off the bat here in this portion by saying three things. Number one, let love be your highest goal. Number two, as a Christian, to desire spiritual gifts. Now, that's something really worth your thought. Of course, it's from God directly to you. But this is something that you and I should actually desire. Uh, many places in the Bible, the word desire is used in our relationship with God. For example, in 1 Peter chapter 2, it says, As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Uh, over in one of the letters to Timothy, um, he speaks about, fleeing youthful lusts and desires. So uh, there's some desires that are not good for us. We should run away from them. But here he's talking about the fact that we should desire these spiritual gifts. And the third thing he says, but especially that you may prophesy. So you should also desire these special abilities. And you and I as Christians ought to, to say, Lord, I want, to, I want you to reveal to me uh, what my spiritual gifts are so that I can actually use them. But especially, he says, that you may prophesy. This special ability called prophecy. And he goes on to explain why he's focusing on that gift, that particular gift. He says, for he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands him, however, in the spirit he speaks mysteries, but he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. So he is focusing on these two gifts, comparing them, placing one of greater value than the other. The Corinthian church had this biblical value reversed. They were really obsessed with the gift of tongues. And he's saying, look, I want you to be pursuing the gift of prophecy, uh, which, is, which simply means to be able to share the truth of God's word. And later in this chapter, he speaks about every one of us being able to uh, share the truth of God's word. In fact, before church, after church, when you're sitting together. Um, doesn't mean that you have to open your Bible and point to a, a Bible verse, but to be able to share the Word of God and to communicate that one to another. As we do, uh, there are certain results that are mentioned here, and we'll go look at those in a moment. But backing up into verse 2, where he's trying to make the, the explanation 
and thus the distinction in terms of importance and why you should desire prophecy. He says in verse 2, For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the spirit he speaks mysteries. If you were speaking in a, the gift of tongues, and the gift of tongues is the capacity to speak praises to God in an unknown language. Uh, it can be used in your prayer life for personal edification. Tongues are not given to every believer as evidence they've been baptized or have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And tongues have a place in the public worship as well, but uh, he'll, we'll deal with that in a little bit as well. But when a person is using the gift of tongues, speaking in tongues, he says here, you're not speaking to men, but you're speaking to God and nobody understands you. Now, if I were to speak in the gift of tongues, it would be an unknown language to you and an unknown language to me. I could stand up here and speak in tongues all night long. You wouldn't understand at all what I'm saying. Now, the result of my speaking in tongues is it would be a blessing to me, but it wouldn't be a blessing to you. However, he says in verse 3, but he who prophesies, the person who is using their known language to declare the word of God, three things occur, edification, exhortation, and comfort to all men. A lot of times, and I'm not picking on Pentecostal churches, I'm just speaking about them because it's appropriate to use them as an illustration because it's very much like what you see here. And I'm not lumping every Pentecostal church together and, and so on and so forth. But a lot of times, uh, Pentecostal churches in particular um, are just like the Corinthians and they're somewhat obsessed with speaking in tongues. And what Paul is saying is, look, when you speak in tongues, nobody understands you. Now, if you prophesy, people will understand you and three things are going to happen. Edification, what does it mean? It means to be made strong. We need to be made strong. We need to be strengthened and we are strengthened through the Word of God. We need to be strengthened because we're so often weak. So the Word of God, you come to church, you've had a tough day, tough week, uh, having a difficulty in your life, you come to church, and the Word of God is opened, you get to sing and, and, and sing songs that have good biblical, the content, the lyrical content is filled with biblical truth, it begins to strengthen you. You can sometimes drag yourself almost into church, but you hear the word. It begins to give strength to you because you're weak. The second thing that it does is exhortation. Exhortation is a, um, a work of the Holy Spirit to encourage you to do what you should be doing in your life. God has already laid out for you what he wants you to do. Perhaps you've allowed some, something to, uh, you know, a gift, you've allowed it to become dormant or you're, you're not quite focused in or you're not lined up with what God wants you to do or, uh, you know, it's just not in your mind. But the word of God has one of its effects is it helps you to do what you ought to be doing. And so you come to church and you think that somebody must have called the pastor and told him all about what's going on in your life because it seems to you that everything the pastor is speaking about is, is right on target with you. Well, well, what do you think I do all day? I'm on the phone taking people's calls. I have this long list and they say, would you please speak about this tonight? Would you please speak about that? Of course, that's not true. But even though we love the Lord, we need to be encouraged, we need to be exhorted to do what we should be doing. The Bible says not to be a hearer only, but also to be a doer of the word. The third thing that happens when you prophesy is comfort. It speaks comfort to men. 
There's so many times when we need to be just comforted. We're going through a time of trouble. We're going through a time of difficulty. And God wants to bring comfort to us, and he does that through his word. So pursue love, Paul is saying. Let that be your highest goal. But desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you prophesy. If you speak in an unknown tongue, uh, you're speaking to God, but nobody understands you. But if you're prophesying, if you're declaring the word of God, you're actually going to be encouraging people. You're going to be strengthening them, encouraging them, and comforting them. Now in verse 4, he goes back to further explain what he's been saying in the first few verses. He says, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. What does edify mean? It's the shorter version of edification. The person who is speaking in tongues, they are being edified. It strengthens you. Uh, a lot of times people use the gift of tongues in their personal devotions, in their personal prayer time with the Lord, and the result of that is that they are strengthened. So if I were to stand up here and speak in tongues, I would be strengthened. But if the he who prophesies edifies the church, and all through these chapters, 12 and 13, one of the constant themes that Paul has been bringing us back to is that all of the gifts that the Lord gives us are really to be used with others in mind. It's for the benefit of other people. And God wants to bless his church. He wants to encourage his church. And so he's making this distinction very clear. If you're speaking in tongues, you're being edified. But if you're speaking in the known language of your hearers, you're edifying them. And of course, Philippians chapter 2 speaks of, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who he put the needs of other people ahead of himself. And that's the way that we ought to be living our lives, is trying to put the needs of other people ahead of our own needs. Now, just to make sure that the Corinthians didn't think there was something wrong with the gift of tongues, notice what he says in verse 5. He says, I wish you all spoke with tongues. So he didn't want them, this is the other side of the coin, he didn't want them to think there was something wrong with it. I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more, the, the bigger wish that I have, even more that you prophesy. So I, I wish you all could speak in tongues. Why? Because you would be benefited by it. But even more than that wish, I wish you would utilize the gift of prophecy of declaring the word of God. Because he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues. How about that? You can't take that for anything less than what it's meant for. He who prophesies is greater. It's a, it's a better gift. If you go back to chapter 12, verse 31, he says, and earnestly desire the best gifts. So here in chapter 14, he's identifying that the gift of prophecy is a, one of the best gifts. It's a better gift than the gifts of tongues. He says, he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. So the edification, the strengthening of the body, is the main goal that Paul has for the church. And it should be the main goal that we have for our church as well, that we would be strengthened. But now, brethren, and he's going to illustrate what he's been teaching and explaining, putting it into application here. He says, but now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, he's saying, let's just pretend that I came to this church there in Corinth, what shall I profit you? And again, just that little phrase, what shall I profit you? That's the backdrop of Paul's heart and mind that he wants to profit you in some way. What shall I profit you 
unless I speak to you either by revelation, uh, opening up the word of God, or by knowledge, the gift of knowledge, the word of knowledge, by prophesying or by teaching. So let's read that right from the beginning there in verse 6. But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues... What shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching? And so he's making application of what he has said earlier. Even things without life, whether flute, which we had one just played here a few moments ago, or harp, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in the sounds, how will it be known what is piped or played? Can you imagine the flautist, who was just up here, if she didn't, I don't know how you say flout, her flautism, never mind. If, are you with me or are you sleeping? Okay. If she was unable to put all those notes together, and make them sound harmonious, we would think, what's that mean? I mean, we wouldn't understand the song at all. So unless they make a distinction in the sounds, unless it's clearly understood, how will it be known what is piped or played? For if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare himself for battle? Now, in that day, they didn't have cell phones, they didn't have telephones, they didn't have computers. Uh, the way that they would gather their troops together and, and begin to move is they would blow a trumpet. And they had certain uh, types of messages that would be trumpeted, and all of the troops understood what each of those different messages meant. And you can imagine if a person who was, you know, using the trumpet didn't make the sound, the right sound, the soldiers would be saying, what's the message? We don't understand the message. How could they prepare themselves for battle unless the trumpet is making, if it's making an uncertain sound? So likewise, with this confusion of not being able to understand, so likewise you, unless you utter by the tongue words easy to understand, how will it be known what is spoken? The answer would be, you wouldn't. For you will be speaking into the air. So you have to try to imagine, and it's hard to imagine because our church is not like this, but it's, you have to try and imagine coming to a church where lots of people are all speaking in tongues. And, and who knows what they're saying? Who knows what they're saying? He goes on with this illustration and application beginning in verse 10. There are, it may be, so many kinds of languages in the world, and none of them is without significance or meaning. And we know that. There's multiple languages. I was just in... South America and heard people speaking in a language that they all understood I didn't understand it I've been to the Philippines I've been to Japan I've been to China I've been to Africa I've been all through Central America South America um, and all of the different places have a different language and they all have a certain meaning, of course. They all, uh, none of them are without significance. Verse 11, therefore, if I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks, and he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. Very easy to understand. If you don't know the meaning of a language, you're a foreigner to, the, to him who speaks. And he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. In fact, when I was just in South America, uh, one of the first things that would happen when I'm talking to somebody is I would ask them, do you speak English? And they would say, no. 
I mean, they at least understood those words. Do you speak English? No. And I told them, I don't speak Spanish. And so we just kind of stood and just looked at each other for about a half an hour. No, we, we would try little bits, you know. They, we each knew a little bit, but not. So we'd say, is there anybody here who can interpret for us? And, and the poor interpreters, interpreters, they would lie all the time. They'd say, no, I can't, I can't interpret. <laughs> because there was such a high demand for them. But as soon as they came over, we were no longer foreigners. I could speak in my language. They would interpret it. Oh, and then they would speak in their language, and he or she would interpret it in my language, and I would say, oh. So unless you understand what's being said, you're just a foreigner. And that's what was happening with the way that the church was using the gift of tongues. No one could understand them. Verse... Uh, 12, even so you, bringing it home now to the church, even so you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, and he's encouraging them now, he's, he's really affirming, he's describing them and affirming them, even so you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, which is biblical, he opened the chapter by saying, desire spiritual gifts, even so you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. And he's already described that the way that happens is by the use of the gift of prophecy. Tongues can edify the church, but there has to be an interpreter. But it's to excel for the edification of the church. And by the way, you know, apart from these two gifts, just as a general principle for you as a Christian, uh, what a beautiful window to look through to the Lord and a prayer to God, a request to God to say, Lord, I want to be used by you. I want to excel in being used by you to help build up the church body that you've made me a part of. You know, when a person has that mindset, they have moved from being a consumer to being a communer with God and with one another and being a contributor to the body of Christ. You know, a lot of Christians are just consumers. They just come, they consume, but they don't contribute. They don't have a desire to participate in building up the rest of the body. And this is a beautiful goal to have, to excel in helping to strengthen the very body of the Lord Jesus Christ who died for you and made you a Christian. Seek to excel for that. Let it be for the edification, the building up of the church that you seek to excel. Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue... Now, here's how you can do that. This is one of the ways you could do that. Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. Because if you could interpret it and it could be understood, then it could be of edification to the hearers. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. Let me stop right there for a moment. Praying in tongues is a spiritual gift that God sovereignly gives to people. It's his decision. Not everybody has that gift. He doesn't give it based on your merit. It's like any of the other gifts. It's, a, it's his, uh, he gives them individually and sovereignly as he wills, we saw in 1 Corinthians 12, 11. But speaking in tongues is the ability to speak to God in a language that you have never learned, your spirit is bypassing your intellect. Let me read it again, verse 13, or verse 14. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. So uh, when I pray in tongues, my, my intellect has no idea 
of what I'm saying to God. It's bypassing my intellect, and for me, that's fairly easy. It's a quick little bypass. I mean, you don't have to go 20 miles this way, and the detour is, <laughs> are you okay, are you with me? Thank you. But um, he says, my understanding is unfruitful. What is the result then of that? I will pray with the Spirit. Paul is, is now affirming. He says, I will pray with the Spirit, and I will also pray with my understanding. So he would sometimes pray in tongues privately, and he would sometimes pray with his understanding in his, his native language, Hebrew, and he, that he could understand. I will sing with the Spirit. You can sing by using that gift of tongues, and I will also sing with my understanding. So two ways of communicating with God. Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, or if you're just using the gift of tongues publicly, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks since he does not understand what you say? Now, implied in that verse, and I hope you're listening, is if the gift of tongues is being used and not interpreted, uh, that's implied here. So let's read verse 16 again. Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, and that's part of the definition of what it means to speak in tongues, you're blessing God. How will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen? Now we learned just last Sunday that the word amen means what? It means so be it. How could a person say to you, if you were speaking in tongues, how could they say amen? They wouldn't know what you're saying. He uses the word uninformed here, the place of the uninformed, which could mean the untaught believer or perhaps the outsider or the non-believer. How will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks? Now that little phrase, giving of thanks, is also descriptive of what takes place when a person is speaking in tongues. You are blessing the Lord, you're giving thanks to the Lord, you're singing to the Lord. Back in chapter 14, verse um, 2, it says, For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. So you're speaking to God, you're blessing God, you're singing to God, you're giving thanks to God. But if a person who's hearing you doesn't understand what you're saying, they're left out, they're not being edified. How could they say amen at your giving of thanks since he doesn't understand what you say? I mean, I sat through this conference in Chile uh, and... Most of the messages were taught in English and then interpreted for the Chileans in Spanish. But then there were several Chilean pastors who spoke and sometimes they would interpret it, the interpreter would interpret it for us in English, but most of the times they just left us out. And one of the times, one of our interpreters uh, he'd be speaking in English, then he'd be speaking in Spanish, and he got confused. He didn't know what he was doing. But I can tell you this, the times when the, the pastors were speaking in Spanish, I listened as hard as I could to understand, get something out of it, but I couldn't get anything out of it. Just little tidbits here and there, because I couldn't understand the language. So, just left out of it. That's why I just packed up and left. I said, well, if that's the way you're going to be, I'm going to go. Verse 17, for you indeed give thanks well. He's redefining part of what it is to speak in tongues. And by the way, the giving of thanks. You know, Paul speaks about it uh, in Philippians chapter 4. He says, look, don't be anxious for anything, but in everything, uh, make your requests known unto God with thanksgiving. Do you know a wonderful thing happens when we are thankful to God and we express it to God? Um, it, it just helps put 
us in the right perspective. And the Bible teaches us to be thankful to the Lord. Many of the Psalms say, oh, give thanks to the Lord. Be thankful to God. There's so much that we can be thankful for and so often uh, we're so occupied with all of our problems they just overtake us and we forget the things that we can be thankful for. And so being thankful is a, is a wonderful thing. It, it helps you so much to be reminded of what God has done for you. And so he says in verse 17, for you indeed give thanks well. You've been speaking in tongues and part of it has been being thankful. You've been giving thanks well, but the other is not edified. And again, he's mentioning the other person. Keep in mind the other person. I thank my God. I speak with tongues more than you all. Which means Paul spoke in tongues a lot because the Corinthians did a lot. And he was thankful to God. So he's not diminishing this gift. He just says, let's get it in its right perspective, its right usage. He said, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Yet in the church, and this is important because he seems to be making the distinction that the most of his speaking in tongues was done privately. Yet in the church, I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. So again, he's repeating, repeating, repeating others. I'd rather say five words to you. Jesus died for your sins. That's five words. Jesus died for your sins. He said, I'd rather say those five words to you than to say 10,000 words, which is a lot, 10,000, in an unknown tongue. Brethren, and he's uh, trying to call them to attention. He asks them to not be something now. He says, do not be children in understanding. However, in malice or in hatred, be babes, but in understanding, be mature. So, he's saying to them, dear brothers and sisters, don't be children in your understanding of these things. And they were. They were like children. You know, kids love to play. My wife, we watch our little granddaughter twice a week, and my wife... Uh, has what's called her prize box and she just we buy stuff all week there's just tons of things you know new toys in this little toy box originally it was designed to uh, act as a uh, reward for her that when she came over she could look in the toy box and select a toy a gift that if she was a good little girl, she could take that home with her at the end of the day. That was the original intention. And so she would get to look in there and she would say, well, I want that one. And then we would set it on the table and say, now, Emma, you have to be a good little girl before you can get this. And she'd say, okay. Well, now it's not that way. <laughs> she comes over, the toy box is open. Which gift do you want? She gets it right away. And uh, that's just the way it is. And she's a little child. And, and when we started this, you know, she said, she'd say, well, can I have it now? And we'd say, no, you have to wait. And then she gets three Reese's peanut butter cups. Gail has this all laid out for her when I bring her home. Macaroni, all this stuff. Three Reese's peanut butter cups. And Gail says, now you have to eat your macaroni before you can have your Reese's peanut butter cups. And so she'll take one bite of macaroni and guess what she's asking for? can I have one Reese? And Gail says, no. And she, can I have one? And she gets all three of them before she's through with the deal. So I don't, I don't even deal with that. I just let it happen. But she's a child. And they were like children. Nothing wrong with being a child. But he's saying, don't be like children 
in understanding. Some Christians, even though they've been Christians for a long time, they're like children in their understanding because they've never grown in Christ. They're not grown up. They're still baby Christians, even though they've been Christians for a long time. And so here Paul is saying to them, don't be like children in understanding. However, he says, with respect to malice or evil, he says, be innocent as babies when it comes to evil. I have to say, my little granddaughter, as cute as she is with her toys and her Reese's peanut butter cups, uh, she's, she's innocent when it comes to evil. She's just four years old. She's, I mean, she can be mean, but I wouldn't even begin to call her evil, you know. Well, I don't even know if she can be mean. Let's, let's move away from that subject because I'm getting way off track here. But this is something else now that he's calling the church to. He's saying, be like a little child when it comes to being evil. How about that? When you think of the things that little children are not involved in, you can make your own list. When you think of the evil that adults can be involved in, you can make your own list. And what he's calling them to be with respect to evil and malice and hatred, he's saying, be like a little child. Don't allow that to take over in your life. However, he says, brethren, do not be children in understanding. However, in malice be babes, but in understanding be mature. Be mature in understanding matters of this kind. And, and this kind is a reference to everything he's been saying. And what he's been talking about here is what to make the goal of your life. Let it be love. To desire spiritual abilities from God. And especially the gift of prophecy. And then he's laid it all out. Here's why I'm saying this. So he's saying, be, be mature in understanding that God wants you to use your spiritual gifts for the benefit of others, that you would excel in that particular area. I mean, you think of our worship team, for example. Uh, they work hard. They, they are excelling in trying to minister to you. You think of the people that work in the cafe. Uh, they're excelling in seeking to minister to you. You think of our ushers. They're working to try to assist you to have orderly function within the church and in the parking lot to uh, help you to get parked and to keep order. All of our Sunday school teachers are technical people who there's people up there nobody ever sees. You, you should see them up there. They're asleep right now. Yeah. <laughs> but all of the different people that minister throughout the week, going to the, the Bible clubs and, and going here and doing that and raising money, the car show, and uh, the different ministries that take place, it's, it's for the benefit of other people. And, and when you think of your body, and you go to the doctor and you have your blood work done and he examines you and he says, you know, you're really in good health. That means that every part of your body is contributing to the rest of your body to make you healthy. And if you get a phone call back after your lab work and they say, listen, we need to see you, it's because they've identified there's some part of your body or something going on in your body that's not working properly. It's not contributing to the rest of your body. And it needs to be addressed because under all things being equal, it's to help the rest of your body. And this is the thing that Paul is really shooting for. It's to be others-minded and to love. And, and, um, and again, you take a strong Christian, a strong 
uh, you know, when you're a baby Christian, you're, you're not strong. You're a baby. No one expects a baby to be an, an adult. But you, don't, you expect an adult not to act like a baby. And when you see an adult Christian, a strong Christian, they've, they've grown in their knowledge of Christ, their love for Christ, and they've discovered their spiritual gifts and they want to use them and they put them to work. That's a strong body of Christ. And, and we have many Christians like that here. So verse 20, brethren, do not be children in understanding, however in malice be babes, but in understanding be mature. In the law, and he's quoting now from the book of Isaiah, in the law, back in Isaiah chapter 28, it is written, with men of other tongues, speaking of the Assyrians, with men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak to this people, and yet for all that, they will not hear me, says the Lord. Therefore, tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophesying is not for unbelievers, but those who believe. Now, this is a very difficult portion, perhaps the most difficult portion in the New Testament to make sense of. And, and I'll try to show you in a moment why it's difficult. But let's back up a little bit and look at how Paul is quoting from Isaiah. He's saying, with men of other tongues, Assyrians, and other lips, I'm going to speak to this people, to the, uh, his own people of Israel, uh, the northern kingdom, and yet for all that they will not hear me, says the Lord. And then he says, therefore tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. So if you take this just as it is right there, and try to imagine yourself as living in the northern part of Israel when the Assyrians came down to bring judgment upon them, those uh, Israelites did not understand the language of the Assyrians. When those soldiers came in there and, and raped and pillaged and burned and took hostage and killed children and burned their houses and their you know, their, their cities and raised them and, and uh, chained them up and were, they were speaking among themselves in the Assyrian language, the Israelites couldn't understand it. It was a sign of judgment. And, and even, even when they were being judged, the children of Israel still would not listen to God. Here they are face to face with these horribly wicked foreign conquerors and they still wouldn't listen to God. And so Paul says in verse 22, trying to identify the use of the gift of tongues, he says, therefore, tongues are for a sign not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. So he makes that distinction. If you stopped right there, you could say, oh, okay, I understand what that's saying to some degree. It's the next part that brings the confusion in. So follow me closely if you can. Therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place, everybody's gathered together, and all are speaking with tongues, which they were, and there come in those who are uninformed or unbelievers, will they not say that you are out of your mind or insane? But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all, he is judged by all, and thus the secrets of his heart are revealed, and so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. You say, well, I'm not quite sure I understood the confusion. Or maybe you picked it up just a little bit. Let me go back over, starting in verse 23. Therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place and everybody's speaking in tongues and implied, there's no interpreter, and there come into the assembly those who are uninformed or unbelievers... Will they not say that you are out of your mind? The answer would be yes, they would. 
But if all are prophesying and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all, he is judged by all. Well, right there, you have the first bit of confusion because if you go back to verse 22, he says, tongues are for a sign not to those who believe but unbelievers, okay, but prophesying is not for unbelievers but for those who believe. But in verse 24, he says, but if all prophesy and an unbeliever or uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all, he is judged by all. So he seems to be saying in one place that the gift of prophecy is for believers, but then he says clearly in the other verse that if unbelievers come in, uh, they're convinced by the prophecy and the secrets of their hearts are revealed and they fall down on their face and they will worship God and report that God is truly among you. So you have to ask the question, why does he apparently say one thing in one portion and one thing in another? I have a couple of possible answers, and I'm not sure uh, if either of them are correct. It could be, and many people believe, that the persons who copied from the original autographs made copies and then copied that this would be what is called a copyist error. And it's a, it would be an error that's not related to an essential doctrine. It could be that the person copying and it just the error just got passed along and thus if you are following the point that we're trying to make you could see, yeah, they, they said one thing in one place and one thing in another. It could be that it was a copyist error. That's a very plausible, possible explanation, and I'm comfortable with that. It doesn't mean the Bible, when we say the Bible is inerrant, uh, uh, we mean that it's inerrant. There are little bits and pieces here and there where there are copyist errors that really make no difference with respect to any major doctrine, so it's, it's of no consequence. Or it could be that what he's saying is that when the gift of tongues is being used improperly and an unbeliever comes in, they, they do think you're insane. implying that if the gift of tongues were used properly and it was interpreted in the public assembly, it could then be used as a sign for an unbeliever. And here's the scenario. A person who speaks a language other than the language of the people who are worshiping God comes in as a guest to that assembly and knows that these people speak a different language and someone speaks out in tongues in that person's language and it's interpreted, it could be used as a sign to them to say, wow, I just heard something about God in my own language from a person who doesn't even speak my language. Are you following me? I mean, don't lose any sleep over this, but if you're thinking about it, it's, you would lose sleep over it. That's why I haven't slept for two weeks now, trying to... No. But if all prophesy, and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all, he is judged by all. And remember back in verse 22, he said, prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. But here he's saying, but if an unbeliever comes in and everybody's prophesying, he is convinced by all, he is judged by all. Now, how do you deal with that apparent discrepancy? Well, it could be the copyist error thing again, or it could be that the unbeliever or uninformed person who comes in who is listening to what's being said, God uses that to slowly bring them under conviction. But the primary usage of prophecy is for the believer. I think that's a reasonable way to look at this. Verse 25, and thus the secrets of his heart are revealed. 
And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. The word of God is powerful. It, it's a mirror. It unmasks what's really inside of us. Not to condemn us, but to lead us to the knowledge of God. So now in verse 26, he, he shifts gears a little bit and goes into how to use these different gifts, the gift of tongues and the gift of prophecy. And he starts off in verse 26 by saying, and this is really his calling to orderly worship or the regulation for the use of the gifts. He says, how is it then, my brethren, or well, my brothers and sisters, let's summarize. Let me just summarize everything I've been saying. Wherever you come together or when you meet together, here's what can happen. Each one of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. When you're meeting together, someone might sing, another person might teach, another person will tell some special revelation God has given. Another person might speak in tongues. Another person might interpret what is said. But everything that is done must be to strengthen all of you. Now you say, wait a minute. Is he, is he in verse 26 uh, saying, look, this is what you're doing and you shouldn't do it this way? Or is he saying, this is what you are doing or what you should be doing? Everybody participating, but all to be done for edification. And if you take that view, and I believe that's what he's saying, that that's what should take place when the church meets together, you have to ask the question, well, why don't we do that? Why don't we uh, have someone who sings? Okay, we say, well, we do. We have somebody who teaches? Okay, we do. But why don't we have someone else stand up and give a special word of revelation or a, no a word of knowledge or speak in tongues? Well, the answer would be this, that these churches back in this day were very, very small little house church type meetings. They were very, very small. And it was more accommodating, more... Um, you, you, because of the smallness, you could facilitate uh, a group of 5, 10, 15, 20 people together. It could be that way. But over time, as churches grew larger and larger, it just doesn't fit the size of the church to have all of these things happening in a meeting. And a couple of things, at least one thing that has happened from this verse is the promotion of the house church movement, which I think um, is rife with problems, really. I think you could take this and, and do this in a home Bible study. Anybody have anything to share? Any, yeah, yeah, I'd like to share this thought. or that, That's a location to do it. But this has really, I think, promoted people moving away from gathering in larger assemblies and, and getting in house churches. But that's a, another message. So he's affirming that there's multiple gifts, but he says, let all things be done for edification or building up. And, and now he gives even more explanation. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two or at the most three. So he's really minimizing the number of times each in turn and let one interpret. But if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in church and let him speak to himself and to God. And that's why in our church, we, because of this setting, uh, we wouldn't uh, encourage people to just speak out in tongues. We would encourage you to do that if you're in a small group and you know there's an interpreter, but not in a larger setting. And even if there was an interpreter in a larger setting, it, it doesn't function well simply because the person speaking out in tongues may not have the vocal and uh, uh, lung capacity and vocal ability to speak loud enough for the person over here to hear them. And if the interpreter's sitting over there, they couldn't hear them. And if they 
were sitting over here and tried to interpret it might not be loud enough it just doesn't work well in a larger setting but we do encourage this in a small setting it's perfectly biblical and if somebody does in a meeting like this speak out in tongues and there's no interpretation I can tell you exactly what happens people go what was that what what just happened here I didn't understand that well what happened well that's not edification that's not helping anybody he says if there is no interpreter let him keep silent don't use that gift in church and let him speak to himself and to God to pray quietly under your breath as it were to God then he deals with the gift of prophecy let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge and apparently in this verse he's saying even in the the setting where there are multiple usages of different gifts there's still a limitation to it let the let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge and he's really encouraging I believe that there is to be the primary gift of teaching that's to be used in the in the even in a small group or a larger group that it's the t clear teaching of the Word of God that should be predominant but back to verse 29 let two or three prophets speak and the others are to judge you say well what does that mean we're to say I don't like you I'm judging you one of the favorite things people say today is don't judge me well that's not at all what Jesus is talking about when he says don't judge uh, when somebody says I have something from God to say we have the responsibility to listen to well what do you have to say and we're to judge it and how do you judge it well you make sure that it lines up with the already revealed will of God simple as that because if it doesn't line up with the will of God then it doesn't and it's of no value so if somebody is professing to speak for God what they say should line up with the already revealed will of God and so there's a responsibility that the that uh, the prophets have and the body has to judge what is being said in verse 30 but if anything is revealed to another who sits by let the first keep silent in other words if someone else wants to prophesy then uh, if some if someone else wants to prophesy they have something to say then the others should be quiet and let that person speak for you can all prophesy verse 31 one by one that all may learn and all may be encouraged and here he adds a fourth thing really he says that you all may learn so you've got edification you've got exhortation you've got comforting and you've got learning which really I suppose you could say the edification exhortation and comforting comes through the learning but the result of prophecy is that you all may learn and be encouraged and then please notice in verse 32 and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets for God is not the author of confusion but of peace as in all the churches of the Saints when he says in verse 32 that the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets it means that person is in control of themselves and it's improper and unbiblical for a person to say well I just I was overtaken by God and I just couldn't help myself and I had to speak out as if God just overrode their free will he's saying oh no the spirit of the prophets are subject you're in subjection to yourself you're controlling yourself and so when you have people who and I've had plenty of people tell me oh I just couldn't help saying it you know just God just took over I would say you have to deal with this scripture right here you are in control of yourself and he's calling for order here he says for God is not the author of confusion you could call it the first church of confusion I mean 
Uh, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Verse 34. Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says, and if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Let your women keep silent in the church. Interesting uh, scripture. And I think we'll just end the study there and, and uh, go home from here. We'd be better off. What does it mean? Well, he's just said in verse 31, for you can all prophesy. But then in verse 34, he says, let your women keep silent. But if you go back over to chapter 11, he says in verse 5, but every woman who prays or prophesies so over there he's affirming that women can prophesy, but here he's saying women are to keep silent in the church. So he can't be saying that they're not allowed to prophesy because he's already said everybody can and women could prophesy. So what does he mean when he says, let your women keep silent in the churches for they are not permitted to speak? but they are to be submissive as the law also says and if they want to learn something let them ask their own husbands at home for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church well I'm not totally sure of exactly what this means but the, to the best of my understanding it's believed that the early church adopted the seating method of the Jewish synagogues which included the separation of men and women. The women would sit on one side and the men would sit over on another side. And sometimes in those meetings, if a prophecy was being given or an interpretation was being given and the church was judging that, there was apparently some confusion where a woman might be kind of yelling across the aisle as it were to her husband what about that and 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 so it seems in context that there was confusion taking place and so he's just saying for the women not to speak with respect to taking a place of authority within the church which of course lines up with scripture women are not to be teachers over men in the church and I think that's a very biblical, fair connection of what's in Scripture. So they're to ask their own husbands at home if they didn't understand something when they get home. And, and by the way, that puts the responsibility on the husband to, to be growing so that you can minister to your wife and encourage her. Well, he winds it up in verse 36. I believe addressing an attitude of arrogancy within the Corinthian church and addressing the people in the Corinthian church who were bowing up against Paul's apostleship because in 1st and 2nd Corinthians strung through there mostly in 2nd Corinthians he had to defend his apostleship and he knew that there were people in the church who said when this letter was read they would disagree with what the Apostle Paul was saying which the church is built on Jesus Christ and the Apostles doctrine the Apostles were inspired by God so what they said wasn't up for uh, negotiation it was true it's up for understanding and questioning I don't understand it but not to reject it because this was apostolic teaching. There's no problem with it. And so Paul knew that there were people in the church who were proud, 
who were not submitted to his authority. He had founded that church. He was still an apostle. It might have been under someone else's pastorate, but he had the authority of an apostle. And so he says in verse 36, or did the word of God come originally from you? And that's a kind of a, not snidey, but it's a, it's a little way of him saying, so who do you think you are? Did, did God's word come from you? Well, the answer to that would be no, it didn't. It came from God through the apostles. Or was it only you that it reached? Are, are you the only people? Did, did, God, did God's word come through you? And are you the only ones that God has spoken to? I mean, you're acting as if you know more than I do about this matter. You have to admire Paul. He was no ninny. In fact, in 2 Corinthians, he, he asks them, he, after kind of really reproving them, he says, look, I'm coming to visit you. So I want you to know I'm coming your way. And he said, it's, he said, how do you want me to come there? He said, do you want me to come there in gentleness or do you want me to come with a stick? I mean, he was ready to go to war with them over the truth. He was holding on to the truth. And, and he knew that pride is one of the things in the church that can just cause so much division. And, and, and may I just say this is not off subject, but just a little sidebar note here. If people at their job spoke to and treated their boss the way they speak to and treat pastors, they would be fired at their job. Am I right or wrong? I'm, I'm telling you the truth. I mean, I'll ask you again, am I right or am I wrong? You say, well, Pastor Bob, we don't know what you're talking about. Well, read between the lines. I'm not complaining. I'm just explaining. And, and this does not mean that a pastor is to walk around wielding a, a, wielding a, you know, a billy club, you know, beating people on the head. That, we're, we're not lords over your faith, but helpers of your joy. But a pastor is to be respected, not to be disrespected. And the people who are in charge of ministry, the elders in the church, they're to be respected for their office and for the work that they do in the Word of God. They're just human beings. They have their frailties, their foibles, their weaknesses, but God has placed them there. And, and it's your responsibility to be respectful to them. And, and certainly that doesn't mean you can't talk or try to gain understanding, but not to inject into the church those things that don't edify, such as backbiting, gossip, division, forming little schisms, little groups, separating people off to yourself. I mean, that's all of the stuff that hurts the church. And there were people in that Corinthian church who, they were kind of saying, well, yeah, well, let's just, uh, who are you, Paul? And he's saying to them, well, who were you? Did the word of God come from you? Did God only reach you? You're, you're acting as if that's the truth. Well, the truth is, he was the instrument. He was the apostle. And he'd just been telling them, look, here's how you're to conduct yourselves. And don't be like children with these things. Be mature. Take the word of God and, and put it into practice. Verse 37, if anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, speaking again to that person or persons, you think you're a prophet, you think you're spiritual, then if you are really a prophet, if you're really spiritual, then let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. If you're really in tune with God, if God has placed you in that capacity, then you should acknowledge that what I've just told you is from God. But if anyone is ignorant, if you want, and now he's just laying it right out there, he said, if anyone is ignorant, then be ignorant. If you want to just reject it and, and ignore, you know, when you're ignorant, it means you don't know. So if you want to be somebody who doesn't know, then just don't know. It's your choice. Therefore, brethren, and he winds it down, he says, therefore, brethren, he, he not only winds it down, but he, he says it all again. 
He says, desire earnestly to prophesy and do not forbid to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. So this is a heavy chapter, isn't it? I mean, it's not your everyday reading <laughs> like, oh yeah, let's go in and really try to figure all this out. But it's very, very important. By the way, we have on the first and the third Sunday evenings every month from five to seven teaching on the Holy Spirit and the gifts. On the first, of this, the first Sunday in December, we'll be teaching on all of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, as many as we can get through. And that's a place and a time where we pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit and teach about the Holy Spirit and allow for people who have the gift of tongues to exercise that gift according to the order here. And if, if there's an interpreter, and in your home Bible studies, those are the places where these things can be done in decency and in order. And a church ought to be well-rounded in all of these things. And, and um, that's how the Lord has led us here at Calvary Chapel. So uh, let me just very quickly mention to you that a uh, couple of things that are coming up and they're just around the corner. Sunday, December 8th is our children's uh, Christmas program. It's Sunday evening, December the 8th at 6 p.m. And then also on December the 11th, it's the uh, crazy Christmas party. This is for the children, not for you. Uh, wear your craziest Christmas attire. Please don't. There will be a special message, Christmas craft, Christmas snacks, and Christmas carols. And then there's some prayer points on raising children taken from last Sunday morning's message. Let me just uh, look at the first one with you. We'll look at this before we receive our tithes and offerings, if you'll take this out of your bulletin. Now, you may remember this from Sunday morning. Children are never too young to learn about God. Many of them right now are learning about God in the, their classrooms. Let's pray that they do learn. Pray for your children that they learn about God. And that we can be good living examples of Jesus Christ. You moms and dads and grandpas, you pray that you're a good living example of Jesus Christ to them. Teaching your children to love the Lord in their early years will help them to stay true to the Lord later in life. You set them going in the right direction. Proverbs 22.6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old he will not depart from it. As mentioned Sunday morning, that could mean if your child is intellectually gifted, then direct him towards the use and development of his intellectual abilities. If he's uh, more gifted with his hands and he's just able to work, then send him in that direction as well because that's where his gifts lie. Could mean that, but it certainly uh, also can mean you train up a child in the way he should go. And the way he should go is to follow Jesus Christ. And if he starts early, when he is old, he will not depart from it. And so you do the best you can with your children. They have to make their own decisions. But let's pray for our children that they'll go in the right way. Well, if we can have the ushers come on up, please. We'll receive the tithes and the offerings. This coming Sunday morning, we'll be in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6. And uh, looking forward to... Um, beginning that chapter and have some other little announcements to make for you and to pray with you about regarding the raising up of leadership here at Calvary Chapel and and uh, we'll just talk about that Sunday morning but um, if you do not have our church app on your device it works on um, Apple or Android phones you can obtain it from iTunes or you can go right to our website and click on. It's a very beautiful app, and it's just uh, been redeveloped. Also, I write a daily devotional six days a week. You can uh, subscribe to it. You could do it right now. You could pull out your device. I know most of you have been watching other things anyways while I've been teaching you, but uh, you can pull out your device and go to our homepage and go to devotional, subscribe, and every day it'll be sent right to you 
It's just a little daily devotional. There's room for nice comments. Let me repeat that, nice comments. Actually, there's someone who moderates that and uh, they, they reject, they have a not nice bucket that they put, no, there aren't any bad comments that come. But it's a, good, it's a great way to communicate and I'd encourage you to participate in it. I thank God for Calvary Chapel and I do pray that God will bless you. I pray that God will lift up his countenance upon you, that he'll give you peace, and I pray that God will make his face to shine upon you and that he'll bless you and that he'll encourage you greatly. That is our prayer. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the word of God. Thank you for your desire to strengthen us. We ask now, Lord, as these uh, offerings, these tithes are being given to you, that, Lord, you would receive them from us as worshipers who acknowledge who are we to give to you that which you've already given to us. All that we have has come from you. And yet, Lord, you're blessed by it and the work of God is strengthened. We do ask, Lord, for you to bless Calvary Chapel in the area of our finances. We pray, Lord, that you might open the window of heaven and pay off the mortgage that exists on this property. It's certainly not beyond your ability to do that. We love you, Lord, more than we can express and more than we know. We especially thank you for being so forgiving. There's not a, a day that goes by that our feet are not washed by you. Thank you for your forgiveness. And Lord, make us as those who would be forgiving to others. Might we walk in forgiveness and imitators of Christ as dear children, forgiving one another as Christ has also forgiven you. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.